Hello there. Well, if you're watching this, most likely you are one of the 50,000 people who has seen the Pillowgate trailer in the first 24 hours since its upload. So you know what this video is about. You know that there is some quite astonishing footage that we need to look at. Now, these are two videos. It looks like they're intended for the induction of new Bethelites, but presumably they're also available just for the Bethel family to watch, just to reacquaint themselves with what the rules are. The first of the two videos is presented by governing body helper Ralph Walls, and it's directed at sisters. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. We welcome you, dear sisters, to Bethel. The purpose of this discussion is to bring to your attention matters of great importance regarding your relationship with Jehovah and with others. In a world that is alienated from Jehovah and that is controlled by a spirit bent on making Jehovah's people unfit for sacred service, we want to admonish you to continue to keep your path clean before Jehovah and his organization. We live in a wicked world that actively tries to mold everyone into its ways. Please turn to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Take note of the strong statement that Paul, under inspiration, makes. and stop being molded by this system of things, but be transformed by making your mind over so that you may prove to yourselves the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul says that we are to stop being molded. Then he continues, be transformed by making your mind over. So this is quite an interesting introduction because it sets the tone for what we're going to see in both videos. Uh, if you're watching this and you've never been a Jehovah's Witness, you're just fascinated by the material that we're going to be looking at, uh, you should know that Jehovah's Witnesses do have this kind of paranoid siege mentality when it comes to the world. In other words, everything outside their bubble is feared and they believe that Satan controls the world, and as Ralph Walls just said, Satan is bent on corrupting God's people. And this is a theme that's revisited in the second of the two videos. They use this scripture in Romans 12 about not being molded by this system of things, and about the need to be transformed by making your minds over what this really is, is a justification for Jehovah's Witnesses to allow themselves to be molded by Watchtower. Satan's world delights in practices that can make us unclean and unfit in Jehovah's eyes, even in seemingly small ways. Unless we take strong measures, we will be influenced by the world, even in subtle ways. The spirit of the world is powerful. So how can we maintain our clean standing before Jehovah? Attraction to the opposite sex is normal and something that Jehovah created within us. Yet in our imperfect state, there are things that we have to be aware of. The governing body loves you and want you to experience the immense joy that comes from serving Jehovah with a clean conscience. So it's for this reason that we share with you frank and specific counsel related to matters of conduct in two areas, your personal habits and in your dealings with others. Let's discuss some of the things that you must be on guard against in your personal habits. Dress and grooming is important for all of Jehovah's people, but for those serving at Bethel, it is especially important that thought be given in this area. Brothers and sisters, parents and young ones, look to the worldwide Bethel family as examples of modest dress and grooming. 
So here Ralph Walls is trying to give some kind of justification for the ridiculous kind of rules and micromanaging that he's about to unleash. And he gives this excuse of, well, these are rules that apply to all Jehovah's Witnesses, but more so to Bethelites because we're under the spotlight. We're the ones that witnesses look to as role models and as examples when it comes to dress and grooming. So this is why this material is necessary. I don't quite follow that logic <laughs> because when I was a Jehovah's Witness, my choices when it came to dress and grooming weren't governed by, oh, well, how do Bethelites dress? <laughs> If anything, I kind of wanted to avoid the rather strict kind of Bethel dress code that is basically inspired by the 1950s. I kind of wanted to avoid that as much as, po as possible. But what's interesting is that this whole material that we're looking at, these two videos, these are rules that do apply or should apply to all Jehovah's Witnesses. And yet they're making... They're spelling it out to this degree just for the Bethelites. And I can't help but see um, a disingenuous streak in the way they're doing that because it's almost like they're ashamed to put this material out there for all Jehovah's Witnesses, even though it does apply to all Jehovah's Witnesses. They're coming up with these excuses as to why it has to be just for the Bethel family which I don't, I can't quite buy into. I think that if the, if these are the rules, then it shouldn't matter whether you're in Bethel or an ordinary rank and file witness. The rules are the rules, and why are they more interested in the spirituality of a Bethelite than they are about an ordinary witness? If these are the rules, why aren't these videos available to all Jehovah's Witnesses? Dear sisters, please. Avoid short skirts or dresses above the knee, tight-fitting, revealing, low-cut, or otherwise immodest clothing. If you do not give thought to what you wear and how you groom, you will likely be influenced by the world's fashions. This applies not only when at meetings, but also during times that allow for more casual dress and when we're working in our assignments. So there you have it. Ralph Walls is telling female Bethelites how to dress. <laughs> and it should just be noted how odd it is that a video about women and about what women should be wearing and how women should be dealing with the opposite sex, it's being presented by a man. It gives a very interesting insight into just how patriarchal the Watchtower hierarchy is and how male-dominated it is and how the advice is essentially from a male perspective rather than uh, being truly thought out with, with women and women's needs in mind. But this is directly controlling what women wear according to arbitrary standards that were dreamt up who knows when, dictating that the the length of a skirt or dress should not be um, should not be above the knee. That apparently is a biblical standard that witnesses need to adhere to. Why should you sisters be particularly mindful of this? Because such immodest dress can be harmful to Christian brothers and even some sisters. Clothes today are designed to sexually excite others, to make the wearer sexy. We're certain that none of you would intentionally desire to make it more difficult for brothers to resist unclean thoughts. We had similar material to this in a talk that was given by governing body member Tony Morris recently in Trinidad. Uh, I've already done the rebuttal, which some of you may have seen where Tony was essentially blaming women for the reaction they get from men if they're wearing something that is sexy. And with sisters, you, you, we don't want you to walk into an assembly hall or a kingdom hall, and you walk in, and because your clothing is revealing, the brothers go, whoop. 
I gotta look away. That's disrespectful. What's that all about? This amounts to victim blaming, because if you were to follow this to the extent of rape, according to this logic, oh well it's the fault of the woman who was raped for wearing something that aroused or excited her attacker. It's very irresponsible for Watchtower to be espousing this kind of logic. Realistically, you must recognize that generally men are more affected by the desire of the eyes as respects physical attraction. One young man said, I personally find it rather hard to think only pure thoughts about younger women when I see the way they dress. Men are more affected by the desire of the eyes as respects physical attraction. This, for me, is proof, if proof were needed, that this entire talk is written by men imposing their narrow-minded ideas or their male-centric ideas on women. And they're just assuming that, that men, because they feel attracted by the desire of the eyes, they're assuming, oh, well, it must be more powerful in me than in a woman, so I'm just going to say this. And hopefully at some point, the facts might bear it out. But you do not make that kind of statement of fact without having evidence to back it up. But of course, when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you don't really need evidence. You can just say whatever you think. And as long as it falls in line with Watchtower's narrative, it's okay. The Watchtower, back in December 1961, had a question from readers that asked, how can girls guard against temptation in this sex-crazy world? The Watchtower said this, It is interesting to note that the male animal has no season in which he is not willing to engage in the breeding act. If we humans would take a lesson from these creatures, we would learn something of importance in matters of sex as to its purpose and the results of its operation. End of quote. I obviously showed this clip in the trailer, in the Pillowgate trailer, and a few of you commented, hang on a minute, is this not kind of invoking evolution as some kind of justification for male sexuality? I would agree with you. And what's interesting is that when you go to the material that he's quoting from, it's actually the December 15th, 1961 Watchtower, there's a questions from readers, pages 766 to 768. The questions from readers, by the way, is fascinating because it talks about, the question essentially is, how can you say that one day animals will all be vegetarians when quite clearly you have venomous snakes and predators and examples in the animal kingdom of animals that are just born to attack each other and it gives this convoluted answer that makes no sense whatsoever. But as an addition to that, it gives this little uh, section, how can girls guard against temp temptation in this sex crazy world? And it says what Ralph Walls just says about the male animal. It's actually referring to cows, <laughs> believe it or not. It says large herds of cattle both male and female wander over the plains feeding. And then it gives this example of bulls and how bulls will only approach cows when cows are ready to mate. And then after the quote that Ralph Walls has just read, it says, as with a cow, <laughs> when a young girl who has reached her puberty is in physical condition to conceive and become pregnant, her sex emotions are greatly aroused. If she has association with a boy, she is inclined to think that it is the sweetness of the boyfriend that causes this delightful and new feeling. And so she becomes infatuated with him. If the boyfriend should become sexually aroused and lets her know it, and then she yields her body to the advances of the amorous boyfriend, she is likely to become pregnant as a result of just one sex experience of this kind. I kid you not, 
that's the sort of material that Watchtower is pointing to with pride and saying, listen, um, I know it's the 21st century, I know it's 2018, but can you guys just read this article from 1961 where we make this fantastic point about humans being like cows when it comes to sex? Men are generally more easily aroused. The August 1st, 1969 Watchtower said, Christian women have the obligation not to dress provocatively, not to tempt men to keep looking at them, and so reap a prideful pleasure in noting how they're able to play upon the emotions of men. So, using your power of reason, you must realize that Satan's system molds the fashion industry so that the clothing worn by women will excite men. Please, be mindful of the need to be modest in what you wear at all times. This is just astonishing, and again, it perfectly highlights the patriarchal nature of the organisation. This script has quite clearly been written by somebody or a group of men with a very low opinion of women. I mean, quite apart from the condescending, patronising tone, quite apart from this madness about men being more uh, sexually excitable than women, you have these assertions being made and I find it interesting that they are dredging up watchtowers from the from sort of the 50s and 60s when, quite frankly, if we're going to do a... We could make a video about all the appalling stuff that the, that the society printed in that period. But it's, it's painting this picture of women who are dressing provocatively so that they can reap a prideful pleasure in noting how they're able to play upon the emotions of men. So they're painting this picture of women who are manipulative and conniving and calculated and trying to lead men astray. These are very... These, these words have been written by someone... Well, these words were written back in the 60s, but they're now being appealed to. They're written by someone with an extremely unhealthy view of women. And this is the kind of logic that is being appealed to by the current Watchtower leadership in the 21st century. The next area of concern is a more sensitive matter. That is to resist the unclean habit of self-abuse or masturbation. This involves the deliberate stimulation of the genital organs. Don't let yourself become contaminated by this unclean habit. So, now we're into the masturbation stuff. And mercifully, the material on masturbation in Ralph's talk is quite short <laughs> compared to the amount of material in the talk to follow, which is directed at men. In fact, if I'm counting the material, the, the number of seconds, in total... Ralph spends just little over a minute talking about masturbation from a female perspective. And if you think about it, this again speaks volumes about how male-oriented these videos are. That they are written by people who aren't really interested in female sexuality because they're not women. So they just kind of have shoehorned this material in because they're going to talk at much, much, much greater length about male masturbation. It's almost like they've thought, well, we need to even this out a little bit by talking a little bit about female masturbation and how wrong it is. Masturbation is a victimless crime. It doesn't hurt anyone. It's perfectly natural. And furthermore, it's mentioned nowhere in the Bible. But you wouldn't think that, <laughs> judging from how much they keep going on about it in these videos. Here's a situation that might arise. A sister views a list of recommended pictures and videos displayed by a social media application. Maybe it's installed on her phone. She comes across some provocative pictures. She doesn't open the pictures but she lingers over what they call thumbnail images, which are small images reduced in size. As she studies them, 
she becomes aroused to the point of engaging in self-abuse. Anyone can happen upon pornography accidentally. This world has made it easy for that to happen. But if one intentionally practices exposing oneself to such harmful images, that may lead to such uncleanness. And that's it. Mercifully, that's pretty much all Watchtower has to say to female Bethelites on the subject of masturbation. Compare that with what we're going to come to later. Up until now, we've discussed personal matters. But let's talk about conduct with others. First, we will discuss something that is very common in the world with single and married persons alike, flirting. In some instances, individuals may not realize what flirting involves. It can involve using flattering speech or provocative body language towards someone with no intention of pursuing an honorable romantic relationship or not being in a circumstance to pursue a romantic relationship. For example, a sister compliments a brother on the way he is dressed for work. On another occasion, she mentions his new haircut. And from time to time, she sends him a text message to check to see that he's arrived home safely. Now, such actions on the part of a married sister or a single sister towards a married man are totally inappropriate and lead to disastrous consequences. If the sister and brother are single, what should she consider? That this brother would be justified in concluding that she has a romantic interest in him. And if she is not interested in pursuing a courtship, she's flirting. And that's damaging. Flirting is cruel and dangerous. It is a form of lying that disregards Jehovah's counsel. The Bible is very plain in its expressions on lying. Proverbs 12:22 says, Lying lips are detestable to Jehovah. So two things here. First of all, this stuff on lying, because Ralph Walls is saying here that if you flirt, well, it's kind of lying, and we know how detestable lying is. What about all of the documented instances in Watchtower literature where they've either predicted something that will to happen in a, by a certain date that hasn't happened, or they've misquoted a scientist or an intellectual, or they've, they've taken a quote out of context in a book to try and push forward their agenda. In fact, I've already talked about this recently. If you go on jwfacts.com, there is an entire page, I think it's called something like Lies and Misquotes, um, where it, it catalogues all of the examples of dishonesty in Watchtower literature down through the decades. They have a track record of being dishonest, but apparently it's okay for them, not so okay if it's flirting. Flirting is what's really bad. It's okay for them to deceive people in their literature. But you, you also have this outrageous rule that if, if a married sister compliments a single brother on, on their haircut or on how they're dressed, this is, quote, totally inappropriate. There is now, and this, just to highlight how crazy this is, there is now more video material from Watchtower on how inappropriate it is to compliment someone on how they look under certain circumstances than there is material telling elders how inappropriate it is not to report child abuse. This, this is where Watchtower's priorities are in regulating the personal lives, the, the romantic lives, the sex lives of Jehovah's Witnesses to the degree that you can't even tell under certain circumstances, you can't even tell someone that they look nice without this being considered totally inappropriate. 
Is it possible that a sister could let her guard down with a married brother? Here's a circumstance where that could happen. A young sister is taken in or adopted by a married couple. So this is one of two occasions in these videos where it uses the phrase adopted in relation to uh, a young brother or sister basically befriending a married couple. It uses this, this phrase adopted as though it's almost like a formal arrangement. And I find it very odd indeed. I mean, if you're serving at Bethel, surely you're an adult and you don't need to be adopted by anyone. You certainly don't need to be guided by any married couples. But what I find fascinating is that this does kind of echo something, a very ugly aspect of Watchtower history, where you did have a young girl who was adopted by an older couple. That young girl's name was Rose Ball, and the couple who adopted her were Charles and Maria Russell. <laughs> and honestly, if you haven't researched this already, it's quite astonishing because it came out in the divorce proceedings that Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witness religion, essentially, or at least the Bible student movement from which Jehovah's Witnesses came, he had an entirely, according to his wife, an entirely inappropriate relationship with Rose Ball, where there was far more than flirting going on. But I visited Watchtower headquarters, and you can quite clearly see Charles Taze Russell um, on full display, kind of wall-to-ceiling images of him. The fact that he broke these rules as regards flirting is entirely ignored, <laughs> and they repeatedly, and because we, we revisit this scenario in Gary Bro's talk, we repeatedly have this concept of a married couple adopting a single person. The husband, who may be older, hugs her affectionately in public, and views her as his little sister. She visits their room often and feels very comfortable talking to the brother about her concerns. The sister feels that they are like family. There's nothing wrong with such relationships. In fact, they can have a wholesome, nurturing effect. Expressions of affection toward others vary greatly in different cultures. However, good discernment and judgment must be exercised. Please be mindful that hugging, stroking, and kissing a brother on the cheek may be intended to convey wholesome love. But keep in mind that marriage does not make the brother immune from becoming emotionally attached or sexually aroused. And if you feel a particularly strong emotional attachment to the brother, it can lead to trouble. And if Ralph Walls has researched at all what happened between Charles Taze Russell and Rose Ball, he knows exactly what kind of trouble <laughs> this scenario can lead to. Overall, though, I just can't help but wonder how this material would be coming across if you are uh, a single sister who's just arrived at Bethel and you're excited about getting stuck into serving Jehovah uh, here in Jehovah's house and you're being spoken down to like this and given these ideas that if you show affection to uh, a married person, well, this is going to be looked at. We want you to be mindful of the kind of trouble you can get into if you stroke someone or, or pat someone the wrong way. Quite apart from whether it's appropriate or not for someone to flirt with a married man or woman, this kind of material is surely going to nurture an extremely paranoid atmosphere at Bethel, where if you're single, you, you don't want to say anything or do anything uh, when there's a married person around because you don't want anything you do or say to be interpreted as flirting. If you are a married sister, your husband has the right to expect that he is your closest confidant and the sole object of your romantic attention. Of course, 
there's a need for balance. Exercising appropriate caution does not mean that you should be stiff and aloof around members of the opposite sex, married or single. Nonetheless, at Proverbs 28, 26, the Bible makes the point that we cannot trust our own heart. I don't see how you can be anything other than stiff or aloof <laughs> after you have sat through this video and certainly the video to follow if you're a if you're a man you're going to be terrified <laughs> of doing or saying anything as I've already said but he also quotes this scripture about the heart being treacherous I can remember growing up with that scripture and it constantly being quoted. The overall effect that this verse has on young witnesses who are, you know, becoming aware of their sexuality is to crush them, is to make them doubt themselves. Well, your heart is treacherous. What do you know? So you fancy this girl. So you like this boy. Well, for all you know, it's just your heart leading you astray. Um, I couldn't help but have flashbacks when he quotes that scripture. Inappropriate use of electronic devices and cell phones is another area that the world promotes. Sexting in the world is common, particularly among young people. This involves sending sexually explicit messages, images, or pictures. How can this happen among Jehovah's people? A sister video chats with her boyfriend. As they draw closer, their conversation turns to discussing sexual subjects. They are progressively more unclean, becoming sexually explicit, perhaps even sending provocative photographs. Both need assistance from the elders. If they develop a practice of engaging in immoral conversations that involve obscene speech or gross uncleanness, such conduct might be a basis for judicial action. Judicial action refers to a situation where a serious violation of God's laws has occurred and a judgment needs to be made to determine whether the individual qualifies to continue as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. How sad for matters to reach that point. In other words, if two consenting adults are in a romantic relationship and sexed each other, and this is discovered by the elders, they can be disfellowshipped and estranged from their families indefinitely. Well, that sounds perfectly fair, honestly. And again, I I'm gonna have to keep coming back to priorities because we've just had material telling adults that they're not allowed to sext someone that they're romantically interested in, that they're, in, that they're even in a relationship with. If you're sexting someone who you're in a relationship with, how is that anybody's business but, but yours and your partner's? And Watchtower is more interested in hunting down people who do this than in dealing with its rampant mishandling and cover-up of child sex abuse. Watchtower, where are your priorities? Please turn to 1 Corinthians 6.18. It reads, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man or a woman may commit is outside his body. But whoever practices sexual immorality is sinning against his own body. In recent years, we have been helped by the faithful and discreet slave to have a clear understanding of what is involved in the Bible's use of the word pornea, or fornication. It relates to sexual relations involving persons not married to each other and includes acts such as oral sex, anal sex, and manipulating or fondling another person's genitals. So now we're going to start talking about pornea, which is the Greek word used in the Bible, and Watchtower has given it this elaborate definition of what it means as regards sexual immorality. 
when you look at the word and you look at its application, I guess you're more interested in giving it this rigid application. Oh, well, pornea means this, 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 and this. If you take the Bible literally, if you take the Bible as the inerrant word of God, if you don't take the Bible as the inerrant word of God, I, you know, pornea suddenly becomes this word that could mean anything and that you really shouldn't be getting too uh, obsessed with. But what's interesting is that Pornia actually crops up in the book Crisis of Conscience. This is my copy. Um, Crisis of Conscience, obviously written by Raymond Franz, who was a former governing body member. And he actually writes about this period in Watchtower history when they codified Pornia. He actually claims to have been instrumental in, in coming up with the understanding of what Pornia meant because he gives these examples of how in the early 1970s, Watchtower was just coming up with these crazy rules surrounding sex that were really causing a lot of distress. And he gives the example, an example that actually touches on my life, of how uh, homosexuality wasn't allowed as grounds for divorce. So let's say you were married to someone and you later found out that they were having homosexual affairs with someone, you wouldn't be allowed to divorce them. And that actually impacted on me or on my family because my mother, as I write about in my book, her first marriage ended because she divorced her husband because she found out he was gay. And what's amazing is that the elders turned around and said to her, well, you can't get remarried because uh, if you remarry someone, you, you, sorry, you're not scripturally free to remarry. And if you do marry someone else, you're committing adultery. And they actually turned people away from her. And then if we pick up with crisis of conscience, Raymond Franz comes to this conclusion about pornea. Well, it means this, this and this. They start pushing out these new um, Watchtower articles, which give very specific rules on what pornea means. In the book, Raymond Franz kind of makes out that that's a good thing. But as we're going to see in this video, it kind of wasn't because Watchtower went from one silly set of rules to just another silly set of rules, as we're going to see. There can be pornea even if there is no skin-to-skin -skin contact. For example, if a couple are courting and become passionately inflamed, and he lies on top of his girlfriend, and they simulate sexual intercourse, even with clothes on, this constitutes pornea. Much has been stated on this matter in our publications. One reference is the February 15, 2004 Watchtower, pages 13 and 14. So yes, you can be disfellowshipped as a Jehovah's Witness, for lying fully clothed with your girlfriend and simulating sex, whether or not there's any climax or orgasm. Just by merely pretending to have sex, you are committing pornea and therefore are deserving of having your family taken from you by means of being disfellowshipped and shunned. Again, this is Watchtower's priority. When it comes to deciding whether to do something about their out of control child abuse policy or clamping down on consenting adults um, rolling around with their clothes on, guess what takes priority? Satan and the demons are desperately trying to corrupt God's people. Unfortunately, some have fallen victim to these snares. That is why, out of love, we find it necessary to be so clear on what Jehovah has set as standards. Although Satan has managed to influence the world's thinking on the subject of sexual immorality and even of homosexuality, Jehovah's view has not changed. That is why we want to emphasize the need to follow Paul's inspired advice. Stop being molded by this system of things. Yes, all of this is loving. 
It's loving that the governing body are interfering in people's sex lives to this degree, where a boyfriend and a girlfriend can't even roll around fully clothed with each other. This is all just a very loving thing. I'm not at all absolute proof that Watchtower is a manipulative, controlling cult. Feed your love for Jehovah's commandments and your hatred for the perversions of Satan's system. Be honest with yourself and Jehovah about your weaknesses. Make it a matter of prayer, as did the psalmist. It is important to dwell according to knowledge, both with others and with yourself. Being aware of the difference in the makeup, physically and emotionally, of men and women. Over the years, the faithful slave has given us much to think about. For example, back in the July 8, 1965 issue of The Awake, pages 16 to 19, is the informative article, A Mother Talks to Her Daughters. And in the December 8, 1968 Awake, pages 16 through 19, A Father Talks to His Son. So we've already talked a little bit about that crazy Watchtower article from 1961 about cows that is somehow relevant in 2018. We now need to, I think, briefly discuss these two Watchtower articles that Ralph Walls is pointing people to, or pointing Bethelites to, that they are just nuts. And again, if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, Maybe you're kind of doubting that, maybe you think this guy's exaggerating. Look up the articles yourself. I'm going to give you two quotes. This first one is from A Mother Talks to Her Daughters. It's from the 1965 July 8th Watchtower. It says, Menstruation is a sign that a woman can have a child. It is a normal, natural thing, nothing to be ashamed of. It's the Creator's way of preparing you for your future role of being a mother. <laughs> so this apparently is relevant, up to date. This is stuff that Jehovah's Witnesses need to consider, material that tells young girls that their role is to be a mother. And there's also the article from the 1960s that's for boys. It takes the form of a conversation between a dad and his son. And the dad says to his son, Remember, the apostle spoke about males becoming violently inflamed in their lust toward one another. It was a matter of men and even boys who develop an unclean passion for sexual intimacy with other males. But as with everything else, there is the small beginning that leads to such a situation, usually giving too much attention to the sex organs. I can remember in my school days, some of the boys got into the bad habit of playing with these organs. So early on, they are linking masturbation with homosexuality, which famously they did outright in the Your Youth Getting the Best Out of It book. Uh, absolutely astonishing material and how Watchtower can be remotely proud of this, I have no idea. The publications, questions young people ask, answers that work, have outstanding material that can be a source of much practical wisdom for young and old alike on such matters. And here are the Young People Ask publications. This was the one that I grew up with. Um, and these are the more recent incarnations that are printed for witnesses today, young witnesses today. I wouldn't quite call them outstanding, if I'm honest. I think a good deal of the sexual repression that frankly scarred me as a young Jehovah's Witness, a good deal of it came from this book. And the way Watchtower controls young people, even to the point of telling them what they can or can't do with their genitals in private, it's, it's frankly grotesque, and it's not something that Watchtower can be proud of. But how interesting that books that were written for young people 
are required reading for adults that are coming to work at Bethel, which again perfectly highlights the way the intended audience for this video are patronised and talked down to. What should you do if you now realise that you need some assistance? Please, take advantage of mature sisters or the elders. According to James 5, 14 and 15, these men are Jehovah's arrangements to raise us up. It is our heartfelt prayer that you, our precious sisters, may keep on guard so as to joyfully walk in the law of Jehovah forever. We pray for Jehovah's continued blessing on you. And that brings us to the end of the video for sisters, and what a fitting way to end a little bit of dishonesty thrown into the mix. Because Ralph Walls here says, well, if you're struggling with any of the things that we've talked about, you can always talk to a mature sister or the elders. And for me, that's rather disingenuous because Essentially, talking to a mature sister is the same as talking to the elders because sisters in the Jehovah's Witness religion don't have any power or authority to deal with matters of a judicial nature. So if a, a young sister or if, any, if anyone approaches a mature sister and says, I've done this thing that's a sin according to the long list of things that you can be disfellowshipped for, uh, they're just going to say, well, here's the deal. You go to the elders about this, or I will. That's what a mature sister can do. If it's not a sin, sure, they can give all sorts of advice and an arm around the shoulder and that kind of thing. But bottom line, if it's a sin, if, if you've done one of the many, many things that Watchtower can disfellowship you for, a mature sister has no hand in things. A mature sister can only say go to the elders. And when the sister goes to the elders, if the elders don't feel she is sufficiently remorseful for what she's done, they will disfellowship her. And disfellowshipping, as you know, means being cut off from everyone you know and love. That, for me, is the side of the story that Ralph Walls hasn't really touched on enough in this little lecture he's given for women who are joining Bethel. Now, though, it's time for Gary Bro's talk for brothers. And I should have mentioned at the beginning of this video that these talks actually have a theme. We've just listened to Christian Sisters, Keep Your Path Clean. We are now going to listen to Gary Bro deal with the theme, Christian Brothers, Keep Your Path Clean. Here at Bethel, we have some of the most outstanding young men in the organization. We are grateful to Jehovah for you and want to commend you for how hard you've worked to meet the high requirements to serve here. There's a particular requirement that Jehovah expects of all who worship him that we want to discuss with you. At 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says, You must be holy because I am holy. So what exactly does it mean to be holy? It means to keep clean before Jehovah and not let sin or the world contaminate us. That's not easy for an imperfect man, but it certainly isn't beyond us either. Jehovah expects us to imitate him to the best of our ability and love what's right and hate what's bad. Or more specifically, hate what the governing body has decided to be bad. Bethel is a holy place. But serving here doesn't mean that you're automatically going to remain holy. Satan's world loves practices that Jehovah hates and promotes them as completely normal. Frankly, we might be drawn to some of those things. The question is, what do you have to do to keep yourself clean before Jehovah? If you go to Psalm 119, verse 9, we can find the answer. How can a young man keep his path clean? By keeping on guard according to your word. So to keep yourself clean or holy in Jehovah's eyes, 
you have to keep on guard. In other words, make a constant effort. Just like Bethel is clean because we all work at keeping it that way every day, each of us has to daily work at keeping our conduct clean according to Jehovah's standards in the Bible. If we don't, our service to him will become contaminated and won't please him. Or, to put it more bluntly, if you don't live up to the standards the governing body has decided for you, you are worthy of being annihilated at Armageddon. The governing body loves you and wants you to experience the great joy that comes from serving Jehovah with a clean conscience. They also want you to avoid the deep pain that comes with sinning against him. That's why we're going to share with you frank and specific counsel related to matters of conduct in two areas. First, your personal habits, and second, your dealings with others. We'll see some dangers you need to keep on guard against in these areas, and then how you can keep your path clean. There is no reason to be embarrassed about what we're going to discuss. You need to understand these matters to keep clean before Jehovah and enjoy his blessing. I just love the way Gary Bro says there's nothing to be embarrassed about in what we're about to discuss. Right before giving what is arguably the single most embarrassing talk, certainly video performance, he is likely to give in his life. I certainly wouldn't wish on anyone for them to have to give a more embarrassing talk or appear in a more embarrassing video than what we're about to see. Gary Bro has really drawn the short straw here. And just in case you don't know who Gary Bro is, this guy is essentially the chairman or overseer of the service committee of the governing body. So the governing body has below it a number of committees, one of which is the service committee, which basically directs all the congregations and has direct oversight over the way rules are implemented, including the rules on child abuse. This guy's in charge of that. Well, not in charge, but he is essentially the chairman of that committee. So we're talking about someone quite high up in Watchtower's pecking order, and yet still he's somehow managed to get lumbered with, again, this totally cringeworthy talk. To begin, let's see three ways in which Jehovah's Word helps you to keep your personal habits clean. The first way you can do this is by avoiding tight-fitting clothes that can identify you with homosexuality. What kind of clothes are we talking about? Some outfits are designed to feminize a man's appearance as homosexuals try to do, especially displaying the buttocks and genitals. Why? Because it makes it harder to tell the difference between a homosexual and a heterosexual man, making homosexuals blend in. So these clothes contribute to changing people's opinion of homosexuality because they come to see it as normal and acceptable. We know that you never intentionally promote that practice. But the question is, how would Jehovah view a man that serves him while dressed in a way that identifies him with homosexuality? Let's read Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, and get his feelings on this. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5 says, A woman must not put on the clothing of a man nor should a man wear the clothing of a woman, for anyone doing so is detestable to Jehovah your God. So what does Jehovah think of styles of dress that make a man look more feminine? Clearly, this is very displeasing to him. Does the way you dress show that you share his viewpoint? I mean... <laughs> I mean, where do we even begin? Where do we even begin with what we've just been listening to? Oh, okay. So, well, listen, um, it goes without saying that this is 
nonsensical, outrageous, ridiculous. First and foremost for me, it doesn't make any sense logically speaking. So we've heard Gary Bro uh, say that tight clothing on a man, we're talking about tight pants, aren't we? Let's, let's you know, say it clearly because this is a personal crusade that governing body member Tony Morris has been on for the last four years. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch my Taking on Tony uh, episode four, in which I give a, uh, I document his slide into fanaticism on this subject. Young men, they're wearing these tight suits. The, the suit jacket's tight, and then the pants are tight all the way down. This is Tony's major crusade against tight pants, and it's worked its way into official Watchtower law. And here, Gary Bro is doing his very best to justify it and to make logical sense of it. But in doing so, he shows how illogical and irrational the whole rule is. He says that um, tight pants make it harder to tell the difference between a homosexual and a heterosexual, making it easier for homosexuals to blend in. So there's this enemy at the gate sort of um, paranoia about homosexuals infiltrating and oh, you're not going to be able to know <laughs> who, a, who a homosexual is and who's gay or who's not gay. They cannot conceive of the idea that homosexuals don't need to blend in because they are normal people. They seem to have this caricature in their minds of homosexuals dressed like the village people <laughs> from the YMCA video. Sure, some gay people like to dress that way, but arguably the vast majority dress like anyone else because they are normal people who do not deserve to be caricatured and stigmatized and singled out in the horrendous way that Watchtower is doing in this video. And the other point it makes, it brings out Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 about how a man should not wear the clothing of a woman and a woman should not wear the clothing of a man and applies that to tight-fitting pants, which we've already heard Gary Bro describe as highlighting or, or drawing attention to the buttocks and the genitals. I'm sorry, but if a piece of clothing is drawing attention to genitalia that mark out your gender, how is that dressing like a woman? If people can, if people can detect the outline of your crotch, how is that dressing like a woman? That is surely the very opposite <laughs> of dressing like a woman. Not that I believe that tight pants do accentuate people's genitals, by the way. That is not my experience of what tight pants do, but even following their logic, it just, it just doesn't make any sense. I wish Gary Bro or Tony Morris, whoever wants to take up the challenge, please explain to me how tight pants are more feminine than ordinary pants if they highlight someone's genitals. Please explain to me how that can be so. There's another factor to take into account. What effect could your dressing in this way have on your brothers and sisters? These clothes are designed to sexually excite both men and women. Of course, it's not your fault if someone else decides to nurture bad thoughts, but you wouldn't want to spark a wrong desire in others or be responsible for making it harder for them to resist bad thoughts. So we've already seen the same craziness in the talk for sisters, where apparently it's your job to worry about the extent to which people are attracted to you due to what you're wearing, or the extent to which people are aroused. Sure, if you're gonna walk out in your underwear, I can kind of follow that reasoning. But if you're clothed, and let's be clear, tight pants are clothing. They are covering everything, okay? Everything gets covered if you're wearing tight pants. If it's not tight, if they weren't covering anything, they wouldn't be pants, would they? They'd be shorts or, or whatever. I can follow the reasoning if you're gonna walk out 
almost naked. But if you're clothed, I'm sorry, it is not your fault if people are somehow turned on by what you're wearing. And again, it's a very dangerous line of reasoning to suggest otherwise. Also, the whole thing is extremely arbitrary. I mean, think about it, whether we're talking about men or women, for Watchtower to come along and say, this form of clothing, regardless of whether it's covering everything, this form of clothing is, uh, is too enticing or too revealing. You shouldn't wear this. Even though everything's fully clothed, it's too revealing. You should avoid it. Well, who's making that decision? And to what extent do we, do we decide precisely what forms of clothing are revealing and to what extent? The, the end game of this sort of thinking takes us to burqas. It takes us essentially to a society where everyone is walking around in blankets that completely disguise their figure. I mean, where do you draw the line? Who gets to draw the line? Again, the whole thing is entirely arbitrary and down to how prudish the people in charge are. A second way you need to keep on guard is resisting the unclean habit of masturbation. The God's Love Book explains that masturbation is the stroking or rubbing of the genital organs, commonly resulting in an orgasm. So, does a person have to use their hands to masturbate? For example, say a brother wears an undergarment that's so tight it rubs his penis as he moves around. He gets aroused and even ejaculates. Is he masturbating? Yes, he is, because he's deliberately stimulating his genitals, even though he's not using his hands. So now we're into the stuff on masturbation. Uh, <laughs> it just gets worse from here, folks. I'm not going to lie. We're, we're into the really crazy stuff at this point. And thanks as well, Gary, for the uh, definition of what masturbation is. We were completely in the dark up to that point. He gives this scenario of someone masturbating just by wearing tight clothing, as though this is a common thing. I mean, if you're going to sit in front of a camera in a highly polished production, I'm, I'm presuming this is you know, really state-of-the-art technology that's being used to film this. There are resources being devoted to the production of this video. And if you're going to make it for an audience of any size, you're going to make it relevant. You're going to make, you're going to talk about things that matter. And of all the things that witnesses who are joining Bethel need to think about, it's this specific scenario where someone wears clothing that's so tight that they wear it deliberately in order to masturbate. That is, apparently is a thing, or it's enough of a thing, for it to be brought up early on in this video. Does there have to be an orgasm for it to be considered masturbation? Suppose a brother starts rubbing his genitals against a pillow. He gets an erection, but stops before having an orgasm. Is he masturbating? Yes, again, because he's deliberately stimulating himself, whether he has an orgasm or not. How about having an emission of semen at night, maybe even after an erotic dream? Is that masturbation? No. Jehovah made that a part of a man's reproductive system, and it happens without any deliberate stimulation. But even so, when this happens to you, it would be good to examine whether you were dwelling on sexual thoughts before going to sleep. Could you have been sleeping in a position that stimulated you, such as with a blanket or pillow held tightly between your legs? If you're honest with yourself about these matters, it will help you to avoid falling into unclean practices. So I guess all I can say at this point is do not adjust your sets. Um, we are going deep into <laughs> the Watchtower Twilight Zone. 
of just, of, well, madness. How, who wrote this? Who wrote this and what were they on? Um, <laughs> because we're, I mean, you can see now where the Pillowgate name comes from. Um, apparently this is a thing. Uh, I mean, <laughs> and I don't want to judge anyone. It's not something I can say I've tried. But this apparently is enough of a thing. People humping pillows. It's enough of a thing to make a HD video about it. And as I pointed out in the trailer, for them to be talking about this on a video that is designed as an induction video for Bethelites, what's been going on in Beth? <laughs> what has been going on in Jehovah's house to make this something that when, the, like, right, guys, we need to put together a script for uh, for new Bethelites. And we, you know, let's kind of tell them, based on our experience, what they should avoid. Well, funny you should mention that because we've been getting all sorts of calls from the laundry department. <laughs> oh, good grief. Anyway, um, I find the part about sleeping, well, the whole thing about pillows is, is fascinating, but specifically where he's talking about sleeping, the position in which you are sleeping could be a problem. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you are sleeping, you are, <laughs> you are unconscious. How can you be blamed for something that you are doing unconsciously? Because when I go to sleep, the position in which I'm lying when I go to bed is not the position in which I'm lying throughout the night. So how on earth can you introduce laws or rules or try to police the position in which someone sleeps? It's just absurd, isn't it? We have reached the stage where Watchtower, where the Jehovah's Witness religion is so... Pharisaical, I'll say it, pharisaical and rule obsessed where there are now sleep laws. What effect does masturbation have on a person's sacred service? Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 explains what Jehovah expects of us. It says, Therefore, since we have these promises, beloved ones, let us cleanse ourselves of every defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So Jehovah wants us to cleanse ourselves of anything that defiles our spirit. In other words, anything that contaminates our mental attitude. Masturbation contaminates a man with selfishness, it weakens his self-control, and it makes him believe that sex doesn't have to be related to love. It also fills a Christian with guilt. Let's just get one thing straight. Everybody masturbates. Everybody does. I'm sorry if you're watching this and you're saying, I don't masturbate. <laughs> if you're saying that, you are a liar. I'm sorry. Everyone masturbates. They just do because it's a perfectly natural thing. And actually, when we're talking about men, because again, apparently male masturbation is a bigger problem than female masturbation, <clears throat> at least according to the number of minutes that are devoted to talk, you know, in these videos, there are actually physical issues that come up if you don't masturbate as a man. And if you're a man, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, there, there's a thing called blue balls, which I don't need to uh, explain to you when you get the buildup of semen because there's been no release at all. There are, there are physical issues that affect you if you fail to masturbate. So for them to be talking about it in these terms where you're, you're wicked, you're selfish, you're this, you're that, this stuff, I mean, for all, I mean, we can laugh at this. But this sort of material has a really tangible effect on millions of witness men and young boys. Um, because don't forget, when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you are limited with who you can marry. You're only allowed to marry from among other Jehovah's Witnesses. So already there's that restriction to think about. 
there's a restriction of not having sex before marriage, and on top of all of that, there's a restriction of not being able to masturbate. So what you end up with is generation after generation after generation of sexually frustrated men. And that is not a good thing. It's not something to celebrate. And what I find fascinating is that Gary Bro says, well, let's read a scripture to remind ourselves of the importance of not masturbating when it comes to uh, keeping our sacred service clean, proceeds to read a scripture that says nothing about masturbation. And how can it? Because the Bible is silent on the issue. And, you know, let's be clear, the Bible has no qualms about going into quite a lot of detail about the things it doesn't like or the, or the things that the writers don't like. We get all sorts of crazy rules in the Bible about all sorts of uh, bizarre situations. Not one verse, not one verse does it say. I mean, it has a thing about wet dreams, but not one verse does it talk about masturbation. So how on earth can you A, go on about it this much, and B, have the goal to suggest that this is a biblical thing. It's not a biblical thing. It's a, a, a case of the Watchtower leadership over many decades being extremely prudish and enforcing their own sexual hang-ups on the next generation with often catastrophic consequences. Trying to keep your service to Jehovah holy while under the influence of masturbation is like trying to climb a mountain with a large boulder that you're carrying. Until you free yourself of it, it can only hold you back. What have you done to cultivate a deep disgust for this practice so as to keep yourself clean? Okay, there's two things here. First of all, you'll notice that question at the end. What have you done? What have you done to um, develop a deep disgust for this practice? And if you're, that's quite manipulative. There's something quite cynical going on there because if you're in the audience, and I mean, goodness knows what's going through your head. <laughs> I think I'm gonna go and serve Jehovah at Bethel. Oh, it's our induction meeting. Oh, they want to play as a video. Oh, this'll be fun. Oh. <laughs> goodness knows what's going on in their minds but in addition to watching Gary Bro disgrace himself with this material you're also having these questions fired at you and I find that quite an interesting control technique well what are you doing exactly because it's repeated throughout the talk by the way uh, they'll give a series of kind of scenarios and when they're concluding he'll say so what have you been doing? And that kind of makes the whole, it gives the talk a very kind of accusatory, almost like a very interrogatory feel when, what have you been doing? You know, this, this, this must apply to you. So exactly what measures have you been putting in place to show your disgust of masturbation? And there's also this thing where he talks about being under the influence of masturbation. What crazy language under the influence of something that people do with their bodies. How would this work with other words that are just bodily functions? You see that brother, I fear that that brother is being led astray by the influence of urination. <laughs> you know, Joe, uh, he's got a real problem at the moment. I suspect he might have a problem with falling under the influence of defecation. Sister Jones, I don't know whether you've heard, but she's having a real problem at the moment with the influence of menstruation. <laughs> it's just, how do you take that word, masturbation, as a grown person who knows how the English language works and just completely massacre its use? Our third point, don't let yourself become contaminated with pornography. Satan's world is in love with it in all its forms. But as you know, pornography in any form is not tolerated at Bethel. What can you do to guard yourself against becoming contaminated with pornography, even by accident? 
Take precautions to keep yourself as far away from its path as possible. Think of the following situation. While in the bathroom, a brother starts browsing through a list of recommended pictures and videos on a social media app on his phone, he comes across provocative pictures of men or women. Some may be topless and some may be nude. He doesn't tap on them, but he does keep looking and starts to masturbate. Now, did this brother truly stumble upon pornography by accident? Or could it be that he was browsing in a place where he actually hoped to find something sexually arousing? Either way, he needs to examine himself honestly, don't you think? Maybe it would be best for him not to use the internet while isolated from others. What precautions can you take to avoid such a situation? So here we are again with pornography, which seems to be something that is really keeping the governing body awake at night. This thought of witnesses accessing porn on their phones or watching it on the internet or taking in erotic imagery by whatever means. Honestly, the amount that the organisation bangs on about this, and I can remember being becoming aware of this as I was starting to wake up from my indoctrination, I can even remember thinking that it felt as though the assemblies and conventions were becoming like anti-porn rallies, <laughs> because it felt as though almost every other talk Porn this, porn that. And don't get me wrong, I think that there are arguments for and against pornography. Just because I'm no longer religious, just because I'm no longer a witness, doesn't mean that I think that, you know, anything is okay. I can see there being psychological issues if you have an over-dependency on anything, including pornography. But I just think that it's one of those areas in which you need to leave it to the person themselves to decide on what works and what doesn't work. If something isn't working, yes, they need help. But what right does the governing body have to police people's lives in this area, especially to the point where it's popping up time and time again in their publications where it's repeatedly being talked about at assemblies and conventions, and even where, despite all of this material already existing for all Jehovah's Witnesses, someone applies for Bethel and, oh, we need to remind you about this thing that we've been reminding you about anyway. The fixation that the governing body has with pornography smacks a little bit of protesting too much. I would suggest that if you're going to jump up and down about anything to this extent, it might be because you yourself have something of a fixation with it. Could certain types of entertainment expose you to the contamination of pornography, even if they're not, strictly speaking, pornographic? Suppose a brother is watching a TV program for mature audiences that contains a sex scene. Now, the scene is shot from an angle so that you can't see the intimate parts of either person. But he replays it several times and gets aroused. Is he keeping himself clean from the influence of pornography? There may not be any visible nudity, but that scene is definitely designed to arouse the person viewing it, and that's why he's viewing it over and over. He needs to work on hating what is bad. What steps do you take to avoid entertainment that could lead you to pornography? Oddly specific, isn't it? In an environment where porn is banned, where you could actually get in serious trouble, if you're discovered with a porn magazine or a, an erotic video by, according to the accounts of people who've been in Bethel, the cleaners are given almost free license to, um, to report you or even investigate you or go through your things and, and report back if anything is found that is incriminating. But in that kind of environment, where basically the only way you could have access to erotic imagery is through watching films that have sex scenes in them <laughs> and, you know, watching them again and again and again, 
someone's had to write this and someone's had to come up with that scenario, which begs the question, how have they thought of this scenario? Could this be a case of them doing it and then, you know, feeling bad about it and taking their guilt out on everyone else? Romans 6 verse 13 explains why we have to keep on guard in this matter. It says, Neither go on presenting your bodies to sin as weapons of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, also your bodies to God as weapons of righteousness. Did you notice that a person can present their body to sin or they can present it to Jehovah, but not both at the same time? If a Christian deliberately presents his eyes to pornography, any worship he renders to Jehovah, no matter how hard he works with the rest of his body, is no longer holy. Jehovah simply does not consent to share our hearts with pornography. Does your heartfelt love for Jehovah move you to keep on guard and avoid disappointing him? So now we have a similar thing to what we have with masturbation, where they're trying to find a scripture that says something specific about pornography, but they can't find one because pornography is not mentioned in the Bible. And make no mistake, there was porn <laughs> when the Bible was being written. We know that through archaeology. I and mean, just look at the stuff that they, the statues that they were making. And yet, the best scripture that they can find to, you know, to lay things out and say, well, this is what the Bible says about pornography, is this one where it says, uh, neither go on presenting your bodies to sin as weapons of unrighteousness. And then they say, well, what you're doing when you're reading pornography is you are presenting your eyes to uh, this sinful stuff. That's the kind of acrobatics they need to go to in order to make the Bible say something about pornography. Next, we'd like to examine with you four ways in which all of us have to keep on guard in our conduct with others. First, it's necessary to avoid flirting, whether the other person is single or married. Now, what would you describe as flirting? Put simply, it's treating someone as if you're interested in marriage when you're really not. Uh, I'm not sure about that, actually, Gary. You've made a very specific definition about flirting being to do with marriage. I mean, that's probably through the Watchtower lens and through the Jehovah's Witness lens. That's what flirting means. Oh, I desire you as a marriage mate. <laughs> but I don't think... Everybody who has ever flirted with anyone has been doing so because they envision wedding bells. How can you tell the difference between just displaying personal interest, pursuing an honorable courtship, and flirting? Well, a lot depends on what your intentions are. For example, a single brother compliments an outgoing single commuter sister on the way she dresses at work. On another occasion, he mentions her new hairstyle. From time to time, he sends her a text message to check that she arrived home safely. Is he just displaying personal interest? His comments go beyond being concerned for her well-being, don't they? He's even telling her that he finds her attractive. She would definitely be justified in concluding that he has romantic interest in her. Is he flirting? If he's actually interested in a possible courtship, his actions may not be wrong. But if not, he would reasonably be viewed as flirting. This is just, I'm sorry, this is the part where you start to get angry. The stuff, the stuff that's coming and the stuff that we've already had about masturbation and extremely specific scenarios being spelled out. Um, it, has a, it has a wonderfully comedic side to it. You can't help but laugh at it. But this is, is really kind of flexing 
the muscles when it comes to controlling people and making them fearful and paranoid so that if you are a single brother and you tell a girl that you know that you uh, you like her hair or you you want to know whether she got home safely this is flirting how dare you be flirting with her if your intentions aren't to marry her how can this have a positive effect this kind of advice is only going to generate an atmosphere of paranoia in the community for which it's intended. I mean, thank goodness this is directed at, at Bethelites. This, is, this video is not going out to Jehovah's Witnesses everywhere. But speaking as someone who spent decades as a Jehovah's Witness, this source of material would make you terrified of saying almost anything <laughs> to a girl in case you're later accused of flirting with them and leading them on. Could persons of the same sex start to flirt? Consider a situation. A group of single brothers has a meal together, and after most leave, two of them remain behind in the room drinking alcohol. At one point, one asks the other if he has ever woken up with an erection. Their conversation starts to touch on sexual matters. Are they flirting? Their conversation can arouse sexual desires in them, even though they're of the same sex. This could easily lead to comments or curiosity about each other's bodies. Don't deceive yourself thinking this could never happen. Keep in mind that alcohol tends to lower your inhibitions and can make thoughts that you'd normally suppress or view as repulsive seem acceptable, even inviting. No amount of alcohol is going to make you gay. I'm sorry, but in the scenario that we've just heard about, if two guys start making out, it's because they're gay. You can't... You can't make someone gay just by plying them with alcohol. Again, this is a weirdly specific scene and you can bet that this has happened countless times and it's going to happen because in Bethel you have an environment where it's predominantly men and, in the case, and usually single men as well because if you're a couple in Bethel you have to live with the restriction of never having children so right away, that limits the number of, of couples that you can have. In fact, I've heard of married couples having to leave Bethel because they've had a child. So you have all of these single guys in an environment where they're not allowed to flirt and they're not allowed to have porn uh, and they're not allowed to masturbate. What? I mean, and you wonder, <laughs> you wonder about this kind of scenario happening. And I actually, uh, in all seriousness, if you haven't already checked out my interview with um, Howie Rutledge Tran, please do so, because that was a fascinating conversation where Howie, who is a gay man, he, he was at Bethel for a number of years, and he went to Bethel on the assumption that he could, that it would fix him. It would make him straight by being at the centre of um, Jehovah's Organization, and you can bet that lots of gay Jehovah's Witness men take exactly the same approach and, and just assume, oh, well, that I'm broken, there's something wrong with me, and the way to fix myself is to, is to go to the, the center of, of where it's all happening and, and absorb all this spirituality. You can bet that that's what happens. And also, it obviously provides a convenient excuse for why they're not married if they can say well actually I'm a Bethelite so that's the reason why I don't have a girlfriend or anything. It's almost inevitable that you're going to get gay people at Bethel who are there because they feel they need to rehabilitate themselves and those gay people are going to uh, interact with other gay people and things are going to happen. I think that's why we've had this scenario painted out for us because that's the sort of stuff that has been going on in Jehovah's house. What if a sister is married? 
Should you feel you can be more affectionate with a married sister than you would with one who's single? For example, a young single brother is adopted by a couple at Bethel, and he regularly spends time with them. The wife, who's four or five years older, hugs him affectionately in public and views him as her little brother. He goes to their room frequently, even when the husband isn't there. And he feels comfortable talking to the sister, even about his problems. He claims they're like family. Is this appropriate? No, this is dangerous. Neither one of them is immune to becoming emotionally attached to the person who is dedicating so much time and attention to them. Of course, there is nothing wrong with becoming friends with more mature couples at Bethel. But keep in mind that a married person belongs to their mate. A sister's husband has the right to expect that he will be her closest friend and the only one giving her romantic attention. I think at this point in the video, it's safe to say that whenever a scenario is painted out for us, what's essentially being said is, this is the problem that we've had. <laughs> and it would be so much more um, easy to watch or listen to. It would be more dignified if they could just open up and say, listen guys, we've had this issue where young brothers have become adopted by uh, married couples in Bethel. One thing's led to another and people have ended up having to be sent home and disfellowships. Just being spoken to on that level like an adult, I kind of, I, I have respect for that, I do. I could appreciate that kind of material. But when it's all of these hypothetical scenarios that are extremely specific, then you have to say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I, I'm being spoken down to at this point. I'm being patronised. You're basically insulting my intelligence by assuming that I can't put two and two together and figure out that that's exactly what's been going on, again, in Jehovah's house. What if you're married? Being married does not give a brother permission to be overly affectionate with sisters other than his wife. You, too need to be on guard to avoid even giving the impression of flirting. What does Jehovah think of flirting? Go to Proverbs 12, verse 22, please. Lying lips are detestable to Jehovah, but those acting faithfully bring pleasure to him. Really, flirting is lying. It's a cruel and dangerous form of lying that disregards Jehovah's counsel about marriage. He hates it, so it's important for you to see it the same to remain holy. Again, how can you be this fixated with flirting but not have any interest in protecting children from child sex abuse? Don't forget that it was Gary Bro who recently went on camera in front of millions of Jehovah's Witnesses and said that they would never be changing the two witness rule. The, the scriptures are very clear. Before a judicial committee can be convened, there has to be a confession or two witnesses. So we will never change our scriptural position on that subject. This is something that puts literally millions of children in harm's way. But top of Gary Bro's priority list, at least on this occasion, is whether people flirt with each other. A second area we want to draw your attention to is the need to keep on guard against sexting and sexually explicit video chatting. Sexting can mean sending sexually explicit messages or even improper photos or videos by some electronic means. This is especially important to keep in mind when you're romantically interested in a sister. Jehovah created men and women in such a way that the more time they spend together, the more attracted to each other they feel. 
That's really a wonderful gift from Jehovah. Because of it, an honorable courtship can fan what starts out as a romantic spark into the flame of jaw, a love that lasts a lifetime and keeps growing. But keeping in constant contact with a sister you're interested in and without taking the proper precautions can be like throwing gasoline on, on that spark, turning it into something destructive. For example, can you see how the brother in the following situation has let his guard down? While video chatting with his girlfriend, they start making some references to sexual subjects. He ends up becoming aroused, and after they finish their conversation, he masturbates. The next time they speak, the conversation goes further and becomes sexually explicit. Now, both start masturbating while connected, but without exposing themselves to one another. Now, obviously, at this point, both need to get help from the elders because their conversations are becoming more and more unclean. They're on the express route to sexual immorality. But what should he have done to be on guard and not let things get to this point? At 1 Timothy 5, verse 2, Paul told Timothy to treat all his Christian sisters with all chasteness. You need to do the same, especially towards a sister you have a romantic interest in. Be aware of the danger and keep your conversations clean. Make spiritual matters a regular part of your communication. Avoid communicating late at night when you might be more likely to let your guard down. In doing so, you demonstrate that you're a spiritual man capable of caring for your prospective mate's relationship with Jehovah. I just don't understand why it's Watchtower's place to tell two consenting adults who are romantically involved with each other what they can or can't do behind closed doors in private. Something that is not affecting anybody else. They're being told that they need to get the help of the elders because they've had this uh, sexually explicit conversation over Skype or whatever. It's none of the elders business. And you can bet that if a sister in particular is being interrogated by elders about what she's done with her boyfriend, they are going to, I mean, obviously I can't speak for all elders, but you hear some real horror stories of elders really getting off on, on hearing these intimate accounts of, of what girls have done sexually that's absolutely none of their business. When is Watchtower going to learn to prioritise? When is Watchtower going to realise that none of this matters especially when you're looking at rampant child abuse on an industrial scale where there are very simple policies and measures that can be put in place to protect children and they're doing nothing and investing all of their energy in this kind of material. Next, we'd like to help you to clearly understand what the Bible means by the phrase sexual immorality, a very serious sin that can quickly destroy your relationship with Jehovah. In the Greek scriptures, that phrase is used to translate the original word pornea. What does that mean exactly? Pornea is sexual relations involving persons not married to each other. It includes acts such as oral sex, anal sex, and masturbating another person. It always involves deliberate manipulation of the genitals and at least one other person or animal. When a Christian commits pornea, the elders always have to provide assistance. And we've already heard that pornea can even involve rolling around fully clothed with your boyfriend or girlfriend. 
That's the sort of scenario in which the elders need to provide assistance. Do the genitals of both need to be manipulated for there to be pornea, such as when two people have sexual intercourse? No, both oral sex and anal sex involve the manipulation of the genitals of only one person. Does manipulation of the genitals always involve the use of the hands? Not necessarily. For example, suppose a brother pays a stripper to perform a lap dance that lasts several minutes. She grinds her clothed genitals on his leg while he's fully clothed. He becomes aroused but doesn't ejaculate. Was that pornea? His genitals aren't being manipulated and he's not touching the woman's genitals with his hands. However, he is committing pornea by allowing her to use his leg to stimulate her own genitals. Can there be pornea without skin-to-skin -skin contact? Say a brother lies down on top of his girlfriend while both are clothed and they simulate having sex. Are they committing pornea? They have their clothes on, but the genitals of both are being manipulated, so they've committed pornea whether a climax is reached or not. That means that even some provocative forms of dancing, such as when a man rhythmically rubs his pelvis against the buttocks of a woman as she rubs herself against him, can also amount to pornea. So, there you have it, folks. Three things that you can be disfellowshipped for as a Jehovah's Witness. Getting a lap dance, rolling around with your boyfriend or girlfriend fully clothed, and certain forms of dancing. What if a person fondles the genitals of another, but doesn't actually masturbate them? For example, a brother sits on the lap of one of his male friends. His friend puts his arm around his waist and at one point fondles his crotch over his clothes. Is that pornea? Although the second man didn't go as far as masturbating the first, he is deliberately stimulating his genitals. Because there is fondling, caressing, stroking, or rubbing involved, this act constitutes pornea. What are the following situation? Two brothers masturbate in front of each other, but without touching each other. Is it pornea? The answer is no, since neither is touching the other person. However, it is a flagrant disregard for Jehovah's laws and a serious sin that has to be addressed by the elders. So, just to recap, if you're struggling to keep up with this long list of rules that we're suddenly becoming familiar with, uh, without necessarily wanting to be familiar with them, by the way, uh, it's pornea if you get a lap dancer, if you roll around with your boyfriend or girlfriend fully clothed, or if you engage in certain forms of dancing. It's not pornea if you literally stand in front of someone and you're both masturbating in front of each other. That's not pornea. Okay. Finally, to keep clean before Jehovah, you have to fight against homosexual behavior. You've surely noticed that we've mentioned several situations involving homosexuality throughout this talk. Why do you think that is? Maybe because you have lots of repressed gay people at Bethel? And I'm sorry, but you do not have to fight homosexuality unless you're gay and you're in a religion where homosexuality is outlawed. Nobody fights their sexuality. Your orientation is what it is. Satan is desperately promoting this perverted practice. It's no exaggeration to say that he's flooded his world with propaganda in favor of homosexuality. It's not realistic to think that you can't be affected by his efforts just because you serve at Bethel. 
At times, you may find yourself struggling with same-sex desires, or you may realize that others are doing so. That doesn't mean that you or they are homosexuals, but it does mean that you have to keep on guard to remain holy. How can you do this? Examine your conduct carefully and honestly so that you avoid situations that can foster homosexual desires. For example, do you avoid unnecessarily exposing yourself to others, such as when you're in the locker room? Are you always modest, even in front of your roommates? Do you have the habit of excessively touching other brothers, hugging them tightly, slapping their buttocks, rubbing them, giving them massages, and so on? Of course, at Bethel, you may sometimes have to use a community shower, and that means you may not be able to completely avoid being briefly undressed in front of other brothers. In some cultures, it may be acceptable for two men to walk hand in hand, or local customs may permit the use of saunas while unclothed. But if you find yourself struggling with same-sex desires, It would be wise to honestly examine whether you need to make adjustments in your conduct with other brothers. Proverbs 6, verse 27 asks, Can a man rake fire to his chest and not burn his garments? The answer is no. Thus, to keep yourself clean from homosexual desires, You cannot put yourself in situations that could bring them to your heart. This, for me, is some of the most outrageous material I've ever seen. In all of my years of kind of reading Watchtower material, both as a believer and now as a non-believer, I've never seen such ridiculous material about homosexuality. You really have two issues here. You have the accusation about gay propaganda, And apparently there's this global conspiracy where Satan's trying to make people gay or make people view homosexuality as normal. Apparently it's a huge problem that gays even exist and that there are people who are sexually attracted to the same gender, let alone the problem of them having the same rights as everyone else and being treated as normal human beings. When, you know, according to Watchtower and according to many fundamentalist groups. Gays are some kind of less than human substrain of the species that needs to be stamped out. It's horrendous, horrendous bigotry. And that's before you even get to this outrageous material, which amounts to saying you can pray the gay away. You know, if you're just, if you're sufficiently careful, if you, you know, watch yourself in certain situations, you can overcome homosexuality it's something that you can uh, you can just manage apparently which is basically repression i'm sorry you do not struggle with homosexuality unless you're a homosexual and what this amounts to is just telling people not to be gay you can't tell someone not to be gay any more than you can tell someone not to be straight it's just ridiculous But this is the kind of material you're going to get from a religion that takes the Bible seriously. A book that says that Leviticus 20.13, that gays deserve to die. Well, of course, you're going to get religions who fall into this way of thinking. That homosexuality is some kind of global conspiracy. And if you have any inclinations towards the same sex, Well, these are things you need to fight, and these are struggles. You can banish your homosexuality and be a straight person. Absolutely unbelievable material, and I'm glad that it's seeing the light of day so that people can see for themselves just how small-minded and bigoted the Jehovah's Witness religion is. For instance, what do you think of the following situation? After exercising together, two single brothers go back to shower in a room. Afterwards, one gives the other, who is wearing only a towel, a massage. One or both of them get sexually aroused. 
they have put themselves in an extremely dangerous situation. Don't you agree? Um, no, I don't agree. If they're both sexually aroused, there's absolutely nothing dangerous going on here. The best you could say, <laughs> the best you could say is that one is sexually aroused and the other isn't sexually aroused. What you have then is awkwardness. <laughs> you don't have danger. Um, you certainly don't have danger when two people are attracted to each other and love one another and want to show it. That seems to be what Watchtower is terrified of if it happens to be two people of the same gender. In fact, they seem terrified of it, period, unless it's uh, a heterosexual married couple. Although Satan is waging war to influence people's thinking on the subject of homosexuality, Jehovah hasn't changed his view on the matter. Homosexuality is unholy and repugnant to Jehovah, and he will not tolerate it among his dedicated servants. Does your love for Jehovah move you to have the same view? At this point, we've moved from bigoted to batshit crazy. I'm sorry. Um, he talks about Satan waging a war uh, when it comes to homosexuality to change people's minds. I'm sorry, if anyone looks to me like they're an aggressor in this situation, if we're talking about war, if we're talking about going out and aggressively trying to change people's minds on something, I think I would say it's religious evangelicals, including Jehovah's Witnesses, who, let's, let's not forget, they put out a cartoon for children, telling children that if uh, someone at school has lesbian parents, well, you need to intervene in that situation. You need to have conversations with their child and try and let them know that their parent, what their parents are doing is wrong. It's this sort of behavior that's manipulative and inappropriate and confrontational. Gay people are not trying to influence other people to be gay because they know that that's ridiculous. They know that you cannot influence a straight person to be gay. They just want to be able to be accepted. They just want to live their lives with no one being hurt. And that's why I find this material when it starts talking about, you know, gay people waging a war. Don't be ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. They just want to be left alone. They want to live a normal life. And this kind of material really isn't helping. We've identified several serious dangers which we have to keep on guard against to be clean before Jehovah. Of course, more is involved than just avoiding what's bad. What else do you need to do to keep your path clean? First, have a regular program of meaningful Bible study. When you regularly spend time with Jehovah by means of your Bible study, it will make your love for him and his commandments grow. Obeying him will make you happy. Of course, when Gary says that obeying Jehovah will make you happy, what he really means is obeying the governing body and their endless list of rules that Jehovah's Witnesses must live by. Second, be honest about your weaknesses. Notice what the psalmist prayed in verses 36 and 37. Incline my heart to your reminders, not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from looking at what is worthless. Preserve me alive in your way. Did you notice that he recognized he needed Jehovah's help to incline his heart? In other words, to make him want to do what was right? Do as he did. Humbly acknowledge before Jehovah that you need his help to fight wrong desires. Be specific and tell him what they are, but then also act decisively. Turn your eyes away from worthless conduct and entertainment. Reject any wrong thought as soon as it comes to mind. This is a problem that is not unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. You see it in other areas of religion as well. This whole concept, Orwellian concept, of thought crime, where you need to feel guilty about what thoughts and desires you have, and you need to 
pray to have different desires or to stop having certain desires and it's wrong to have certain thoughts when you're in a religion that's policing your brain. We've already been told in this video that it's possible to sin in your sleep by ending up in a certain position while you're unconscious. Uh, but now we're being told at the end, well, don't forget as well that you can sin in your brain by having the wrong kind of thoughts, thoughts that we don't approve of. And when you start having these thoughts, you need to do X, Y, Z. This is the ultimate form of control. When you have any kind of organization or religion or political party trying to influence and police what goes on in your brain, that is something that, believe me, you don't want any part of. What should you do if you now realize that you are or have been involved in some type of unclean or questionable conduct, such as what we've considered? Frankly, you might be embarrassed and even afraid to ask for help. That's not uncommon. But please think about what Psalm 119 Verse 176 says, I have strayed like a lost sheep. Search for your servant, for I have not forgotten your commandments. Like the psalmist, if you've been involved in unclean or questionable conduct, seek help from the elders right away. We love you and want to help you get on a clean path again. The governing body loves you too. It's our heartfelt prayer that you, our precious young brothers, will keep your path clean and joyfully walk in the law of Jehovah forever. So there you have it. That is the conclusion of the Pillowgate videos, or what we're calling at JW Survey, the Pillowgate videos. And it ends with a reminder that if the audience is struggling with any of these areas, that they are lost sheep, including, by the way, if they're gay. Apparently, if you're gay, well, it's because you're lost and you need to be found by spiritual shepherds. But no, if you are going against the rules in any of the ways that have been discussed, if you're guilty of pornea because you've been rolling around <laughs> clothed with your boyfriend or girlfriend, well, then you need to approach the elders and you need to get help, which as we know, can often end up with disfellowshipping and shunning. Honestly, the, the extent of control, I don't think I've ever seen any material that so clearly highlights the extent, I, I mean, I keep using the word micromanaged, but what other word is there to describe what we've just seen? When you have your thoughts policed, when you have your sleeping policed, when you have your masturbation or what happens in, in, your own, in the privacy of your own dorm room policed, this is not healthy. It doesn't breed a healthy human being. Sexual repression is dangerous. It does have far-reaching consequences. And it's no exaggeration to say that it will be causing havoc in the lives of millions of Jehovah's Witnesses today, and most certainly in the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses who are unfortunate enough to wind up at Bethel and suddenly be under even closer scrutiny as to what goes on in their private lives. But all in all, I am absolutely thrilled that these videos, which were intended to be secret, intended just for Bethelites, I'm thrilled that they're now publicly available. I'm glad that people can see for themselves that this is the nature of the organisation. This is the pharisaical, rule-obsessed organisation that they are serving if they're a Jehovah's Witness. Listen, I'm going to try and make this material available unedited because lots of you have been saying, well, we want to be able to show this to our still in believing Jehovah's Witness friends and family. I'm aware of that. Obviously, I can't do that on my YouTube channel because then I would be in breach of copyright. I can show you what I've shown you because I'm commenting on it and criticizing it, um, or in the case of the trailer, parodying it. 
but I can't just upload the whole 57 minutes without there being repercussions. So I will figure out some way of making this material available or facilitating it becoming available at some point um, without any shame, by the way, because this is something that witnesses need to be aware of. They need to see that this is the organisation they are dedicating themselves to. I should also add that if you're watching this video immediately after it's been uploaded, in other words, on the weekend of the 27th, 28th of January, we're hoping to do a Watchtower in Focus episode on the Monday, or we'll be recording it on the Monday, hopefully for release on the Tuesday. So if you're watching this video and you have things that you want to say, we do actually have a voicemail so that you can call in and give us your thoughts and we might be playing your message back while we're recording. The address that you need to use is speakpipe.com forward slash cedars. If you leave your message, again, we'll try to include it in the show as we have time. But that's about all I have time for. I hope you found my thoughts interesting. I'm certain you'll have found the videos themselves interesting. Please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And as always, thank you for watching.